Stephen and Randy Flyfield. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of them. Then Steve's going to take us through some of the things that he's done as an entrepreneur. And then together we're going to sit down and uh, go through some questions on how do you become an entrepreneur? When, when do you know you're an entrepreneur? Do you ever know if you're an entrepreneur or not? Uh, and then we'll open it up to you for questions as well. So to begin with, we have Mr. Stephen Fifield. Stephen established the Fifield Companies in 1977 as a suburban office developer here in Chicago. Could you please welcome Stephen Randy? I'm going to start off by asking our guests some, some questions and then uh, we'll open things up. And uh, obviously they're, uh, again, very nice of them to be there and they're very approachable. So let's all learn something from this tonight. Uh, Steve very well uh, described his business to us and, and the background. Um, my first question I have for these two is I consider you to be entrepreneurs. Do you... Do you agree with that assessment? I'm guessing from your last comment you might. Is, is that a, a good description of, of one or both of yours? Oh, yeah. We are definitely entrepreneurs. There's no doubt about that. And that is, be, I think I like because of the, every project is a new plan. You know, you, you were working right into one of the lectures for tonight or next week about market research and things like that. So every project, they do some market research. Okay, terrific. Um, what, what are the attributes of an entrepreneur? This group, everyone's in this classroom because they have an idea or hope to someday have an idea within their corporation or as an individual to be an entrepreneurial. What, what does it take? Well, I guess, you know, if you looked in a textbook today, it'd say, you know, you need to be a leader and you need to be organized and you need to have integrity. Um, my mom was an immigrant and so she raised me always feeling as though, you know, she came to the land of opportunity and as, you know, the inside track, you know, that you'd get from one's parent, she always said to me, Randy, you know, one day you do what you love to do because, you know, if you develop a passion, you'll never feel like you're working. So that might be in a book today, but she also told me to never rely on anybody else to make me happy, that that was my job and that if I had something to do, even if it were a trade, if I were happy doing it, that was a good use of my time. And then as a woman, she always said, have your own bank account. So, you know, I think that, and I do, uh, okay. you know, um, uh, so I think that those are, are things not always written in a textbook. But with um, my life with Steve, I've really learned to be a dreamer because when we came together, you know, Steve had an illustrious career and um, had lost literally <coughs> everything. And I was a girl who, I probably had a greater net worth than Steve, but I still was just happy with our two pennies that we could rub together. And one night he said, you know, well, you know, what would the world look like if we didn't have two pennies? Let's just write it all down, everything that we dreamed about. Because in your dreams, you can have anything that you want. So I, I could have a great car and I could have a whatever it is, and we laid it all out and we put it on a board and we said, you know what, this is actually doable. We'll be able to buy a house and we're able to have children and we're able to have X. And then we needed to write down a plan on how we were going to get there. So write down your plan and dream and, and go from there. And it's okay if it changes. It will change as you go. But I think the key is to write it down and to have big plans because, you know, what is, I always tell my kids, if you shoot for the moon, you <coughs> land among the stars. I want to add something to that. So I put down really short notes here. Work your ass off. <laughs> be driven. Be prepared to work very long hours. Love a challenge. When you get down, get knocked down, just get back up. Because we've all been, any entrepreneur you've ever met, particularly serial entrepreneurs like us, because we've done real estate, we've also you know, in a mortgage company, a lot of savings loans, thank God we sold before they changed the regulations. And, you know, you make mistakes and you lose money sometimes. Sometimes you lose most of your money. And, you know, you just figure out a way to get back up. Because there's a ton of people out there with money who want somebody with a lot of energy and a vision who think, you know, who they think can execute to give them money to, to help them execute. But it's like a, a joke I heard the other day. Do you know that the Motel Association of America, do you know that 40% of the members of it have the same last name? No. Patel. 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 Yeah. Yes. Okay. And, but 
What have all those Indian immigrants brought? I mean, they're all entrepreneurs. They work their butts off. Their families, you know, do the, the cleaning and stuff yeah. like that. And they make a fortune. And they, they improve the revenues. They refinance. They buy the next hotel. And, uh, you know, I think that, that hunger, that drive, is what really makes for good entrepreneurs. That is hard to beat. Then. Thank you. And uh, at some point, you know, and, and, you made, and you wrote a plan, which also flows very well into this course. So if anyone doesn't want to do what's due session 10, listen to the five views. Uh, when did you think you could do that? I mean, there's, we, in the first couple <clears throat> sessions here, we've been trying to determine, you know, are we entrepreneurs? And how did you know that you were going to be able to do it? I think I knew um, really early on, I mean, as a child, I was very competitive, I was very creative, I had lots and lots of energy, and I can actually remember looking at things thinking, that doesn't work very well, or I, I know that I, I, I have simple solutions. It's not like I'm a brainchild, I'm definitely not the smartest girl in the room, but I could change the world 1% at a time in ways that people didn't want to change the world. So I knew when I was young. How about you, Steve? Did you know at any time where it just evolved? I don't know if it goes every other generation. My grandfather was, you know, a relatively successful businessman, and he kind of handed the farm to my father and uncle, and they became home builders, which I never wanted to be. <laughs> uh, and they made an okay living at it. But I remember when I was about 12 years old, my dad saying, hey, we're trying something different. We're doing some duplex rental units. And for whatever reason, uh, I, tried, I wanted to figure out how it worked. How much did it cost to build? What did you pay for the land? What are you going to get for rents? How would you get the bank loan? All the same things I do now, you know, almost 50 years later. Yeah. Uh, and I always had that itch to try and do something on my own. Also, I, my first two jobs out of school were working for privately held companies. And I looked at those business models. And I looked at how those owners treated their employees. And now that I have a company of my own, you know, we serve lunch at our company. And uh, when I worked for those other people, I was never said, I was never told thank you. I was always told, like, why isn't the contract bigger? Or why didn't you close it sooner? Yeah. And, and we tend to be, Steve and I both, very nurturing and, and very loving people. We give mid-year bonuses if we're making money halfway through the year. Everybody likes a bump, and so we are happy to, to give bonuses. We celebrate the holidays with not only our employees, but with their spouses, and we thank their spouses for being supportive because we realize if they're working really hard on a job, that's time away from their families, and so we see that mate as um, you know, helping us, and we have very, very low, low turnover today because of those things. Uh, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel, but we're trying to be mindful entrepreneurs and to pay it forward, if you will. That is outstanding, and you can expect to get my resume in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's a, here's a soft one, but it's also a hard one. Is an entrepreneur born or made? Made. Circumstances. I like that answer. I, I think it's both. Um, you know, there are visionaries like Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg. Um, All came from difficult backgrounds, difficult families where they're a little hungrier. Ah, Every um, successful developer I know is, from, <coughs> is not from the perfect family, the rich dad, hmm. everything was perfect. Yeah. They all have a reason to feel a little bit anxious and try harder. I, Interesting. But through YPO and World Presence Organization, I know many people that were given <coughs> an opportunity to run somebody else's company and were groomed maybe from the mail room all the way up and they very successfully run these businesses now or have bought their businesses. And I ran into a turnaround guy yesterday, and he said, you know, it's not the entrepreneurs that are at risk, or it's not the, the people that are coming up the food chain. He said he buys more turnarounds from third-generation yeah. family members. So um, I, I just thought that was an interesting tidbit to share with you. That is statistically accurate. Oh, good. All right. Um, I've uh, preached to this group that an entrepreneur has to be able to sell, whether it's to investors, to bankers, to customers. Uh, do you agree or disagree with that? Steve's the client guy. I'm, I feel like I'm always selling. I'm selling to the employees. I'm selling to the bankers. I'm selling to my civic, um, you know, uh, 
passions, but I, I don't know how many of you have read The Tipping Point. We love to read in our family, and I love motivational books. And so I feel as though I'm a connector. I, I share my knowledge, I share my touch points, I share my positive words, and laughter is a universal language. So from you know east to east coast to west coast, if I'm laughing about something or even a joke, I'll just pass it on and say I'm thinking of you, even to people that I'm not doing business with, maybe people that I've done business with before, maybe people that I want to do business with. But there's something about touching base or touching in that you know you feel that connection. Me, I say it, ABC, Glengarry, Glenn Ross, the movie, always be closing. <laughs> Everybody we do business with, whether it's architects we hire, bankers we borrow money from, we're always selling ourselves, and we're always selling our competence, our integrity, you know, the things that are important to getting business done. Yeah. What, can, what advice can you share? You know, my students over the years have said things like, well, for us, you know, you're comfortable in front of a group. For me to get up and try to talk to a group of investors, or even one-on-one, -on -one, I'm, I'm a bit of an introvert. Any, any advice you can give to somebody like that who, who maybe doesn't have that sales gene in them? Yeah, uh, I'm an introvert. Uh, I, it's like that, all that jazz where the uh, fellow stands up, Ray Scheider, and says, it's showtime. Yeah. You know, I'd rather be sitting at my desk analyzing things and figuring things out than actually in front of the banks or whatever doing it. But you have to do it. Yeah. I think Freud was an ego, super ego ed. Right. You know, you that face that you put on. But I think that, you know, where we've been successful, and Randy is a natural extrovert, and she's very good at sales. And, you know, when I met her, she was a sales manager. Um, preparedness is everything. If you're selling something, whatever it is, I mean, for me, it might be going to a bank saying, I want financing for this project. I've anticipated every question, difficult question, they're going to ask. I'm trying to figure out what is it that will get them to do this deal and what are their concerns, and I have those answers prepared. So it's all about preparedness. If you're an entrepreneur trying to raise money to become a cookie manufacturer, you're going to go in and the people, that when you walk out, are going to know that you know everything <coughs> about the supply chain, the manufacturing process, the distribution. They're going to walk out and say, you know what, I'm going to put money with this person, I'll lend them money, I'll invest, because you know what you're talking about. You don't need to be some super salesman, you just need to know what you're doing cold. And I think if, you, if you're authentic, and, and you're, you know, you look good and you feel good. Confidence comes from the inside. Uh, recently our daughter was going to an interview and I said, before you open that door in your head, maybe even out loud, you say, you're going to love me. You know, and they might not always buy your product. They might not always loan you the money. But if you go in with that win-win, even if, you know, there's always a next time. So, you know, put your best foot forward. Oh, and by the way, rejection. That's part of this whole pitch thing. <laughs> We used to joke, but it, the statistics are probably about true, that other than California where everybody wants to invest money, you have a project in Chicago, you might call 20 investors, all of whom you know or have met before, and get turned down by 19 of them. So the expression we have in our shop is it just takes one, mm -hmm. because we get rejection. And we may have a well-conceived project, we think we've figured it all out, and whatever reason, that bank, that investor, <clears throat> just isn't interested. They're not doing this kind of deal now. They've got too many they've done already. Their plate is too full. You know, the feds are regulating them too much. They're afraid to do new construction financing. But, you know, if you put too much money up, maybe they'll give you a loan. You're going to get a lot of rejection. You know, every, every entrepreneurial business is a ton of rejection. As long as you've got confidence in what you're doing, and once in a while you actually get to do it, <laughs> and you know that you can get it done, you can take that rejection. There's one more thing I'd like to add is that lots of times in real estate we give presentations with multiple people in the room and after we leave the room we have a chance to <coughs> sit around a table and critique ourselves. And um, we made a presentation to GE and they were actually our business partner at the time. And it was Steve and the man who was running the numbers and myself. And Steve gave the pitch well, of By the way, it was an MBA from DePaul. Oh, such a <laughs> smart, company. smart guy. Yeah. So Steve went in and uh, gave the pitch of his life, and hit, you know our numbers guy said, 
they were so awesome. They were definitely not going to ask to replace us. And I said, you guys are full of shit. We're like cooked. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I think that, you know, having a jury of peers and, and practicing and, and, you know, reviewing. You know, and never take it personally. You know, when they were going to replace us, we didn't have a chance going in, really. I mean, I think that we made the pitch of our lives, but you know, sometimes you just have to like look at the odds and say, I'm going to go and give it my best shot, and maybe. And sometimes your odds are better, and you're going to get it. But don't take it personally. And this, by the way, was on a deal after we'd already done the Civic Opera Building with GE Capital as a partner, and GE had made a total home run as an investor. Ah. So even though they made money with us, doesn't mean they were going to do it. Okay. Sometimes people are making decisions not about you. You know, lots of times when you have an asset like a building, you know, they have pension funds and people that they're responsible to. And so if they say it's time to go, you're not doing a bad job. It's just time to go. And that's part of, you know, being a good partner. And that's a perfect segue into the next section of partners. You know, uh, uh, some of the group here might be asking for money from somebody. somebody. <coughs> well, then... Have a partner. What do you What do you look for in a partner? What do you want? What do you want to avoid? The, uh, you know, when you recruit people and you interview them, you know, they always say you fall in love with the candidate, or maybe you project your own stuff and you say, hey, this is really a great candidate, and then you hire them and you, or her, you find out later that they weren't the right candidate at all or they weren't as productive. So it's all about referencing. And I, I remember I, I took a two-day course in recruiting people 20 years ago. And at the end of the course, I said, you know, I learned one basic thing. you got to work the shit out of the phones, call on their references. Mm -hmm. And you call their references, the ones they give you, which aren't the ones you really want to talk to, and ask, who else did they work with? Can you give me their number? And then you call somebody who might actually tell you the truth. And the truth may be, they really hated to lose this person. They were the most productive. They were great. Or the truth may be, they had all kinds of problems, didn't show up. When the going got tough, this person disappeared, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. The same thing goes with everybody you do business with. You've got to talk to the other people they do business with. And, you know, you hire, you know, you, you, you visit a contractor, and they say, call our three clients. You're going to want to try and find client number four and five, too. And then find out, hmm, this contractor is always looking to take advantage of you. And if the drawings aren't perfect, they're going to jam you with big cost overruns. Or, you know, you call enough people and you find out this contractor, when they give you a price, they stick with it. If there's changes in the drawings, they work with you, they don't try and take advantage. Money sources, banks, it's all the same thing. you got to reference, reference them like crazy. And uh, you'll be surprised that the ones who appear to be great, you know, the banker says, hey, I'm easy. You know, whenever you hear somebody say, we're easy to do business with, <laughs> Your antenna should go up. <laughs> Excellent advice. <laughs> and it, it's hard in the beginning. You know, as you go along, you will you know the lawyer that's going to protect you. You will know the designer who gets your lingo. You will know the vendor that you can rely on that's going to show up on your opening day with cookies and flowers and say, I have two hands and a good heart. You know, you tell me what to do. But it's really hard in the beginning, so be very careful. And then keep your, what is it, keep your enemies... Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Mario Puzo, the Godfather. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he stole His favorite it. movie. I think he stole it from either, uh, what's the guy, uh, Sun Tzu? S Sun Tzu. Oh, Sun Tzu. The oh right. Yeah, the Art of War. <laughs> Another good one. Right. That's correct. Yes. That's right. That's a fundamental business manual. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Uh, after the Prince by Machiavelli. But, uh, okay, well, <laughs> you're taking notes here. By the way, he was paid by one of the Medici's to write the book so that he could protect himself from his other family relatives. <laughs> ah, so it's so bad even back then. Yeah, watch out for the wine. <laughs> 14th century matters. How about uh, uh, one thing that happens in an entrepreneurship, in an entrepreneurial activity is there's always lack of cash. Cash flow is, is you know, will be the, the death to so many new opportunities. How have you successfully managed that? especially given the capital-intensive business here? Um, I know guys who've done deals by having a lot of credit cards. Literally. Mm -hmm. Cash advances, boom, boom, boom. You know, get started, the small thing. But usually what you do is you, you got to start small. I mean, I started, you know, uh, I worked for a big developer, you know, out of graduate school. I went to the other school south here. And... Um, uh, 
I went to family members and borrowed money, and the money I borrowed from them was to put an earnest money deposit to buy a 40-unit apartment building in Lincoln Park. And then I had 60 days to close, and I ran around like a wild man. This is before we had all this institutional money. And met with every lawyer, every tax lawyer, every accountant, all of whom had the same thing in common. They had rich clients. And this is a time when you got money from lawyers and accountants. You know, today there are other ways to get money. You hire brokers, you go to institutional people. But family money, friends, you know, the seed money to get started. Uh, and it's hard. I mean, it's really hard. And I can't tell you the number of people go out where it's like, God, if I just had $100,000, you know, and, you know, I, I'd be able to move it this far and then get it together. And just getting that first 100 or that first 20, you know, can make all the difference in the world. Um, but I think you just, you know, it's like it's like everything. You know, you go out and sell your idea you know, and, and the like. So, and by the way, I ran around all those law firms and I got lucky. And one of the investors, with a guy by the name of Stan Harris, his family had known Harris Bank. <laughs> and he took a liking to me because in the, in the meeting, the attorney asked me such tough questions. And I had the answer for every question. I walked out, and he related to me later that when I walked out, the guy said, we got to give this guy money because he's <laughs> going to make money for us. And we bought, actually, that was my second deal, the, the deal with Harris. We were buying a building actually right over there, 105 West Adams, the banker's building. And, uh, you know, I said, we bought it. He put the money up. I got a little sliver and a little commission, and that's how you get started. The other thing I'll tell you as an entrepreneur, don't give up your day job until you feel like you've got. I've got a son-in-law right now who is a partner in a company that sold to Google. He's 37 years old, made a couple million dollars. He's almost run through it now trying to do his own startup. Ah. I said, why the hell you got offers from all these high-tech companies who are the chief technical officer for several startups? Why are you running through all your money? You know, do your day job, keep looking for what you're going to do. And then you find something. Line the money up before you go out. Don't go out and leave your family for 12, 15 months while you go through your savings. So there's a joke in real estate, and it's, you know, how do you end up with a small fortune in real estate? And the answer is, does anybody know? Start with a large fortune. You start with a large fortune. Exactly. So, you know, when you look at the history of real estate in Chicago, there's been lots of great fortunes made and lost in the real estate business. Now, Steve and I suffer from the same madness. Besides, you know, building, what, uh, $5 billion in, in projects, one building at a time, which is what our company does, uh, I've also been responsible for investing family money, uh, over $100 million in redevelopment. And we cannot afford to invest in the same That, by the way, was $100 million in equity. There's a lot of borrowed money in there. Yes, a lot of, a lot of borrowed money. Mostly borrowed Still money. a big number. But we, we um, we will, uh, sometimes I participate in Steve's deals, sometimes he participates in mine, um, but lots of times we're our own, you know, we're, we're sailing our own ship. He'll say, you know, good luck to you. And I say, good luck to you. So, you know, we have to be careful, and in times like 2008 and 2009, somebody has to be holding a lot of cash. So, you, you know, you have to keep it. I'd say, you know, always have extra cash reserves, you know, pad your contingency if you're looking at doing something like this. And then, you know, for your families, insulate your family. So, you know, put away money for your colleges and put away money. We had an investment come that we'd actually forgotten about, thank God, you know. So, you know, we sat with us yesterday. Yeah, you know. But you, you do have to diversify, you know, whether you're running a, you know, food company or whatever. You know, don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Don't ever let your spouse co-sign notes with banks. And don't ever sign a personal guarantee. If your spouse you own the house, it. if you have a good marriage, if you're pretty certain about your marriage, because that will be one of the first assets that goes when the banks come after you, if you have a problem. Those are two. Can you repeat those again, please? Those are two important things. Don't uh, sign a personal don't, guarantee. Don't have your spouse co-sign guarantees with you. And I have friends who run $100 million businesses wives are still signing notes. I think they're crazy. I think they should change their business yeah. structure because if something goes wrong, everything is gone. You want to protect And something. by the way, if you go into the bank and you're, you know, starting to get momentum in your deal, they know you're doing this stuff. As long as you've got enough assets in addition to that house, they're going to make you loans. 
that they may ask you, but then you should be doing business with another bank. And in fact, you should never rely on one bank anyway, because they all change their interests, some get in trouble, they tighten up lending standards. You know, we never work with just one bank. You know, we do have very strong relationships with a couple of banks, but you need to have a juggle. And then, you know, the uh, if you have a house, put it in trust for your wife, for your children, you know, maybe you have a, a prenuptial, or not prenuptial, but a, a, a mar you know, marital contract, something goes wrong, you know, it's not like, you know, you go down that road, you have nothing, you know, if you have trouble, yeah. then yeah. your wife leaves you for, you know, your account. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, there's some practical things like that. Yeah, see, my wife's not going to leave me. She's going to push me out of the porch. And, uh, well, it's because you have a big insurance policy. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, I never should have told her about that. Uh, you, one thing we're going to be practicing here, Steve and Randy, in, a, in another couple of sessions, is working on our elevator pitch. Here's our idea. We've got 60 seconds to educate our listener on what we want to do and how much we need. Do you, do you have such a thing? We don't have an elevator pitch because every deal is unique. However, there is a structure to pitches. And I think the chairman of P&G about 30 years ago made the comment, any good idea can be presented to me in one piece of paper. And that's true. The highlights, you know, what you're going to do, what you're asking for, and how you're going to get there, the outline can be done very succinctly. Um, and I think, you know, the pitch means, you know, you, you got to you got to refine what you're asking for. Right. I personally cannot go in from memory and do pitches. I usually write it out just like when you set these questions, and I kind of looked at what you know what I would say. Uh, you know, you want to write down your notes or type them up and bring them to the meeting. You know, we had a meeting yesterday. We just won something that isn't public, and we're not going to talk about it. But oh, come on, had, you can tell us. We'll yeah. 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 We won't tell. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this will be on the oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> But we went out to meet with the, the other party, and it's a you know, $100 million piece of business. And, um, you know, the day before, I told uh, my senior construction guy, where's your outline? And the outline kept the meeting very focused. And, you know, we'd already shaken hands on the deal, but we have a lot of work now to do to go from here to there. And, uh, and we went right through the outline. We covered everything. And of course, they're so happy that they're doing business with us because they can see, you know, we sure. got, you know, our pitch down, so to speak. All right. So, if, if you're going in for your closing pitch, you know, if you've been asked one, two, three times, don't be afraid to ask for that sale. You know, don't be afraid. Are you going to give me the loan? Look people in the eye and say, listen, you know, you've asked me back three times. Are we doing this deal? You know, I think a lot of people go in the third ABC. time and say, thanks so much. And and even in our own firm, you know, I'm usually, you know, a, I'm in a male-dominated business. So, you know, <coughs> people are leaving, they say, oh, thank you for coming, thank you for coming. Do you have any more questions? And all these people are sitting around the table saying, oh, thank you for having us. No, I'm good. No, I'm good. Well, I want to know. Am I leaving here with your money? Do you have your confidence? <laughs> right? And, and so, you know, don't be afraid to be the person to say that. And a quick no is a favor. Absolutely. Uh, because there are some people who Cut bait. can't close a deal internally. They can't get their approvals done. You may be dealing with the wrong person. You know, I, I don't want to pick on the banks, but they're easy to pick on. Absolutely. You know, you might go into the assistant VP and ask for a five hundred thousand dollar loan. You don't even realize that he has to go up two levels. If you happen to know the VP of the division, you're talking to the guy who's going to make the recommendation. You know, so you've got to be, you know, think about, you know, trying to get the answer. And, and if, try and figure out whether the guy or gal you're dealing with is a person who's actually going to get the deal done. You know, like somebody said, uh, you know, if, if, a couple of expressions, front door, back door, side door. If you can't get business done through the front door, try and find a way in the side door or the back door. If you've gone to somebody, and, and we talk about this, everything we do, you know, we're particularly pitching money, debt and equity. You know, who are we talking to? Is that person capable of getting it done? Do we know somebody who's done business with them? Oh, they never close a deal. It's always the guy above them, or it's the gal who's the VP of the division. How do we get to her? Who do we know that's done business? Oh, can you have them call and see if they can get the introduction done? Just like when you're looking for a job, you network the heck out of them. 
you know, and doing business with any of these companies. And the biggest judgment you're going to end up making is that intuitive feeling about people you do business with. When you walk out, what's your gut say? Because they can tell you that when her gut says that that kind of deal in Las Vegas and that kind of deal in Florida was something I shouldn't be doing, I should have listened to her. <laughs> she wants money in both projects. Um, and you, it's with people, projects, things you're pursuing, listen to your gut. We, we spoke about that just last week, about the value of the gut in making decisions. You know, it reminds me of something I want to say. Yeah. Just in case some of you decide you don't want to be entrepreneurs, I'll tell you the next best thing, go work for a private equity fund like him. <laughs> I tell my friends that what I know about the private equity funds and how they operate, if I had had that decision, knowing what I know today, I would have a hard time choosing between being mm -hmm. a real estate developer and working for a private equity fund. Because some of the best talent is there. I mean, there's a lot of talent. Yeah. You know, they're entrepreneurs. But, you know, you look at where the smart people are going today who really have figured it out. And uh, either go work for a congressman for a couple of years, make a lot of contacts <laughs> in the business world. Yeah, I know guys who are million dollar year partners in law firms who sacrifice the five years to work sure. in Washington yeah. as somebody's aid. And guess what? They made a lot of friends. They had a huge network. Yeah. You know, but the private equity funds are, are a great place to be, too. Thanks for that point. It's very entrepreneurial. Yeah. Work, you know. It is. It is indeed. Absolutely. But, you know, people think that, um, you know, real estate is location, location, location. But it's a game of math. So, you know, you need to buy it for X, and you need to be able to build it for X, and you need to sell it for Y. You know, but somewhere between the X and the Y is really what you're going to make. But, um, you know, right now we're looking for an analyst, another analyst, and we're trying to find a female analyst, and they just, it's just not happening for us. That's probably because they're all going to the private equity. <laughs> yeah, or hedge funds, right? We, yeah. yeah, we hope they're doing better than what we could do. But. Although they work about 70 hours a week. Yeah, the right, private equity right, that's right. The hedge funds. But it's really being an entrepreneur, you know, whether you're working in food or, or you know, selling your widgets or doing whatever, it all comes down to the math. So you have to have, have, to have that understanding and um, to be able to, to see the writing on the wall. You know, that tells the story right there in a nutshell. They might like your packaging and they might like your creativity, but it's all in the bottom line. Randy, how about uh, you, you together you've had great su success, uh, but you've also been in and out of the home, raising the children. How in the world have you balanced this uh, very high power career with raising a very successful family of seven? Mm -hmm. So, you know, real estate ebbs and flows. It expands and it contracts. And, um, you know, I've had really good partners in my world. You know, our kids go to a private school and so I can email and get the update. I have a, a partner who's willing to be flexible with me. Um, I have a breakfast in the morning. <laughs> he does make, he makes a great breakfast in the morning. Um, and I like to multitask. So I, I still to this day, I have a lot of energy. And my kids, I, I take my kids with me to the job site and we have a lot of fun with it. It's kind of like what we do even on vacation. You know, we'll be, you know, skiing the mountain and saying, okay, which is the best site? And <laughs> what do you see? And um, so I have a lot of, a lot of fun with our family. Um, as well as working. I wouldn't say that it's for everybody. There are times when I was telling Ramo, I um, had about $40 million in deals, and I went into Steve's office, and I said, Steve, I've decided something. He said, what did you decide? He said, I'm going to sell everything, and we're going to move to the suburbs and have another baby. <laughs> and he said, who are you, and what have you done with my wife? Because I want her to come back right now. I have no interest in moving to the suburbs or having another baby. And, um, you know, we've, we've, we've done that a number of times, um, so I, I, it's, it's been great for me and great for my children. She's like Jerry Reinsdorf. Years ago, he had a real estate investment company called Valcourt, which he later sold to American Express. And he put the group together and bought the Chicago Bulls. And he was being interviewed by a sports person who said, how do you run the Bulls and Valcourt? And he said, it's easy. I spend 75% of my time in Balcor and 75% of my time in <laughs> I like that. And that's how you've done it. Fantastic. Yeah, we sometimes we're doing stuff at midnight, one in the morning. That's why I made my earlier comment. I want to be an entrepreneur. It isn't a 30 hour a week job. You got to love what you do. You love what you do. You don't mind putting the time in. 
I mean, we'll go home tonight, and both of us, after the kids, we put the kids to bed, at least the ones we get to bed by 10. Yeah. You know, we'll both be on the internet, catching up on emails, doing a little bit of analysis on something, and, uh, you know, that's just how it is. And then, you know, we'll crash in bed at 11.30 yeah. at night. Still talking about deals. Watch The Mentalist, <laughs> Fringe, you know, whatever favorite show is. But it, it also, too, helped having a great partner because when um, I made the decision that I wanted to come back to Chicago and build K2, you know, Steve you know, drove the kids to, to school or, you know, he um, went to the parent-teacher conference without me. And so I think having a supportive mate and somebody who, you know, even when he said, I don't think you're going to be able to get the money to get that deal done. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm going to get that money. Um, he still did what it took to keep our family intact. And, and also, you know, as much as you try as an entrepreneur to see all of the things, there are things that you won't be able to see in your business, like health issues. In my marriage to Steve, he um, broke his back, and he also had heart surgery. And when I had to go to the company and travel for the company and do different things, we would check in by phone and by email, and um, he would have the children come to him in bed and do their homework. I mean, you know, you might not always be able to control the circumstances, but I think if you try to make the best of it and you try to be a good partner, it's all going to work out or work out the best it can. I said to these two, they exhaust me. <laughs> they do it all. They do it all. What I'd like to do now is open it up. If anyone uh, in the class, just go ahead and raise your hand, and I'll let Randy be the, the proctor here. So, Eric. Um, well, thank you both for coming. Uh, just for five field days, we were both just talking about it. said pretty succinctly, get ready to work your ass off. Um, we saw a speaker last week who added the caveat, but also know what to work on. Um, and he, he talked about starting up a company and you focused on being the primary salesperson but got a little too in, in depth uh, with the sales and forgot about the management side. How have you, you both um, kind of balanced both, you know, doing the hard work but not micromanaging too much and being able to stick with the management side? Well, I think it's a very insightful question because you know, there's a, an expression we have in our business which is the best deals you do are the deals you don't do. <clears throat> learning how earlier in your career to be able to sift through things that are worth putting energy in and eliminating the ones that aren't, that is a tough thing to do because I, I know earlier in my career I chased a lot of things that I learned later learned I could have spent one-tenth the amount of effort on and rejected. And so we spent a fair amount, like in real estate, you know, people, brokers uh, present different sites that might be available or uh, you know, we hear about a deal being available, and we try and go in and hit the couple key things that will decide whether it's feasible or infeasible. So, for example, apartment developments, which are very active right now, you know, we haven't been able to do an office building in over five years because uh, of job losses and companies not expanding. Um, somebody will send us a site and say, here, I got a site, it's going to cost you six million dollars. And I have one question that comes out first. I want to see all the rent comps in that immediate marketplace. Because we're going to waste our time talking to contractors on costs because we have a general idea what they're going to be. You know, and you know, the fees we got to pay the city and how long it'll take to get the approvals. But if the rents aren't there, you know, in the city of Chicago, case in point, Rents are low enough in the South Loop that land today is basically worth nothing for apartments. Because every 10 cents of rent is worth about $13,000 a unit in land value. So if rents in River North are $2.90 a foot and they're two twenty dollars in the South Loop, which are facts, that 70 cents means that the site in River North, which is the hottest market today, River North, you know, Kinsey, Hubbard, you know, all those areas, all well, the clubs and restaurants, all the things, places you like to go on the weekends, people want to live there. That's $85,000 swing between them. Well, what it really means is that the land is worth $50,000 a unit at River North and minus 30 <laughs> on that site there. So if you can come up with metrics for whatever entrepreneurial activity you're trying to do, like I want to manufacture custom baby food with only organic ingredients, you know, as a manufacturer, you try and figure out, okay, what are the key things I need to know right away? And you might figure out, 
okay, my distribution and the margin markups for the distributors I'm going to have do it for us. I got to be able to, you know, nobody will pay more than a dollar jar. So they want to mark up, so I got to be able to produce and make a profit. 60 cents a jar. My gross margins need to be 40 percent before my general overhead and all. I mean, if you're in the manufacturing, which I don't know enough about, you know, and you work backward, and so you realize the first thing you got to figure out is how much does it cost me to produce. And if it's 60 cents, and I got to get a dollar 60 a jar at retail, and Walmart, you know. Because you're say you having to work for a food company, you have to know the industry. You know that Walmart isn't going to pay a dollar sixty, and maybe you can find specialty stores to do it. But guess what? Those specialty stores are going to let you get about this much in sales. You know, so you try and look for those metrics that will eliminate all the nonsense fairly quickly, and then you can focus on where, you know, where you're going to make money. And you also asked about management, you know, how do you, you know, <coughs> have that balance of management and sales, so it's all good. So we base our projects on budgets and time matrices, so that we are watching the system as we go. We have Monday morning meetings, and so we all connect with our managers at that point in time. And then, you know, there is an intuitive or a spidey sense to, you know, hey, when I look at the big picture, you know, um, how is this all gelling? And after you do, as many projects as, as we've done, you kind of, you know, know the smell of something that's not clicking along or, you know, running in. And we always say you can never fire a bad employee too soon and better to, um, if you think that there's a problem, tell. You know, don't be sweeping it under the carpet. Even if you just think, you know, say, hey, you know, I could be totally wrong about this, but I'm just getting that feeling. Or when I looked at this, particular color or this particular thing, it just didn't seem to look right. I'd really like you to come and help me. So we always give, you know, these key phrases and these hot buttons so that you can manage your products and your your, your projects, um, even throughout the country. You know, we have the same lingo. And there's a few of us that, that do it. You know, Steve and I do not do this by ourselves. We keep our business very small, by the way. So we outsource. Steve, um, before me, had an inside you know, architect, inside interior construction, inside house lawyer, and all of these people were in house. And when I looked at everything, it's like, oh my God. And his lawyers were encouraging him to go back. And he said, Isn't this a great plan? And I said, No, I don't think this is a great plan at all. I'm, I'm so super honest, you know, and it's really difficult because, you know, men's ego is like, I could just crush him that day. Like, oh, no. And he said, So, like, I never asked for directions either. <laughs> <laughs> so, when I looked at the home of Gila, he said, You know, so if it were you, what would you do? And I said, I'd outsource all of these things. I wouldn't, I wouldn't Which have. Which we do today, by the way. We, you have the same business model 20 years later, so you can buy the best architect, you can buy the best, you know, whatever you want, buy the best that you can afford, but don't bring them into your house, so you have to pay them insurance and overtime and compensation and all of those things, and you make it very clear and you're transparent that when the project is over, you've paid them X amount of thousand dollars and they're very happy and they're still going to be your friend, whereas if you have to say, I'm so sorry, I don't have anything else for you to do, I have to let you go. It's much harder. <laughs> well, and years ago, I met Bob Pritzker, who was one of the was one of the patriots. He just died in the last year. Uh, the Pritzker family, the Tyatt Corporation, TransUnion, you know, all billionaires. And uh, we actually built an office building and negotiated a lease on them. And they moved their one company called Marmon Group in it, which is now owned by uh, Warren Buffett. And uh, I got to know Bob. He was really he was the engineer in the family, so he ran the businesses. And his brother Jay bought the businesses. It was a good combination, but Bob made a comment to me one day when he heard we were staffing up for expansion. He said, I've never hired an employee until I really needed them. Mm -hmm. And that was such an insightful comment on his part because, you know, you get some investor to give you money to do a startup, and the first thing you want to do is start hiring up. you got to work your butt off until you absolutely have to have them because, you know, you get ahead of your budget or you get your overhead increased too fast. You know, you can just suck all your working capital out before you can even get the job done. And so Randy's right. And you know, we do outsource everything. We have a very small company. And we do what you know, it's public information. We do roughly three hundred million dollars a year in business. And we have twenty three employees. Mm -hmm. um, so we hire the architects, the engineers. You you kinda go one step at a time. So, you know, we, we did nineteen units. 
We did a small suburban office building in uh, Schaumburg. Uh, you know, a warehouse in Itasca, a little larger office building. We got a tenant's pre-signed so that the bank said, oh, you got 70% of the so you do a little bit bigger building. And you just kind of work your way up. And um, I kid somebody today uh, who was actually kind of BSing me. We were negotiating and, you know, he was, anyway. Uh, he said, oh, this is too complicated. These numbers are too confusing. This guy has been developing for 30 years. He knows the numbers backwards and forwards. He's playing the dumb farmer trick you know, with a city slicker, okay? So if he was a city slicker and I'm the dumb farmer. But, um, you know, it's just another zero. I mean, 40 units or 400 units. Do you think it's any different? You hire a manager, a resident manager, you hire a contractor, an architect. You know, you just work your way up. You get to a point where, you know, the banks know that you did 100 units, so 120 units didn't such a reach. And then 160 units isn't that much more than 120. So it's just working your way up. At the, at the same, excuse me, sorry. At the same time, one misstep could be the end of your career. Yes or no? Um, no, I made some missteps. Um, <laughs> I mean, we lost a couple big equity positions just in the last three years. Smart investors know that not every deal. In fact, uh, I kidded a guy today. They said, haven't you heard about the baseball theory of real estate? He said, baseball theory? I said, yeah. You want to get up to bat as much as you can. Otherwise, the guys who say, I'm going to build this landmark building. And by the way, the big landmark buildings almost never make money. Mm -hmm. The big ego buildings, super design. When you see the super tall buildings, uh, generally it's a big corporation and it's not a money you know, thing for them. They're doing it for image. When Donald Trump built the second tallest building in Chicago, he has lost money on it. He's already written off his investment and bought the second mortgage at a discount. He's still probably going to lose money on that. Um, but I kind of got off track to that. Um, no, you're answering his yeah. questions. But yeah. you, you're going to make mistakes and just trying to try and have more wins and losses. Make the losses small losses. The wins don't have to be big wins. People look for some consistency. But, you know, you're in Lincoln Park, you know, Charlie and Harry Huzanis, mm -hmm. James from Real Estate, mm -hmm. you know, Michael Lerner, all these guys, you know, uh, well, I won't bore the group with all the names, you know, that you probably know. Those guys haven't had a home run in every deal. But look for a mentor. Look for somebody that you can go to. I mean, you're not going to compete with Steve Fightfield. But if you say well, to not him... not for 500 units. No, no for 40. But if, if you said, Mr. Fightfield, would you have lunch with me? Can you show me? He will show you. You know, there are lots of people out there that, just like that took me under their wing, they want you to succeed. They want to show you how to do it. Not everybody, but if you find, you know, I mean, no, there are people that That's will. how I met Randy, by the way. She was rehabbing houses and I was building large office buildings. She wanted to pick my brain. I wanted to take her out. <laughs> <laughs> so it worked out well. <laughs> it's a win-win. But Randy is absolutely right. Not only mentors, collaborators, brokers that you work with, contractors, banks, all of these people you make your friends. I don't mean phony friends. I mean you're, you know, you communicate with them regularly. You stay in touch. And you will find that you will have many mentors in your career. And they'll come in various shapes and sizes. I mean, you know, when you're a kid, it's the coach, it's the minister or the rabbi, you know, that gives you some advice. Um, a professor, you know, I got steered. I wanted to be a math professor. And my, uh, my advisor, who is also, you know, in, you know, the head of the math department uh, when I went to college, said, you know what, Steve, you're smart, but... PhD at Princeton, you know, where Einstein taught, you're not going to cut it. It was a wake-up call for me. I graduated first in class in high school. I was an honor student in college. He said, go to the University of Chicago. They have big quant, you know, all the quant jocks go there. And I was a quant jock, you know. So I got mentored at that stuff. I went to the University of Chicago. A professor who gave me the lowest grade I got in graduate school because he was pushing hard took me under his wing directed me. And, you know, you'll find that all throughout your career. Look for those people. Ask people. You you know, they're not going to just volunteer to be your mentor. You're not going to go up yes. and say, would you be my mentor? 
It'll be like, hey, can I have lunch with you? I want to ask you. I want to talk to you. People will take an interest in you and your career, and you'll be you, you'll be shocked at what happens, whether you're, you're an entrepreneur, inner entrepreneur working within a company. You don't have to be an entrepreneur and just go out and start your own company. That's the most painful way, by the way. <laughs> you can do it within companies, too. You can be the guy who's pushing to develop new business, new business lines, you know, buy that competitor and consolidate, whatever it is. And you look for those people in your organization, preferably who are a couple of levels above you, who may be able to pull you up. You never, by the way, want to have a mentor who's immediately above you because you're a threat to them. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Um, have you ever had a situation where you go to the bank or to the investor with your idea, with your uh, project, and then um, they all say, no, no it's not going to work? And you, 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 I, I mentioned that you, you have to get up. You have to get, up, get back and say, no, we'll try the next bank. But has it ever happened to you where you have to change and go back and reverse? You know, am I on the right track? Is this a valid project? Is this a plan that I have? Is it? Hey, sometimes you've got a plan, and going to all these people will help you refine your own plan. Sometimes, if enough people say no, you may believe in your plan, but there may be reasons that are outside of what you think can be done that isn't going to make it possible to get done. So I said, you know, you can get turned down by 20 people as long as you need you know, one or 19 and get one. But the other side of the coin is, is that every person you meet with is going to give you insights and help you refine it. If you take a stock plan to somebody and take the same plan to every person, you're not listening. Because some of you say, well, what are you What about this? Ah, oh, I should answer that. But what about this? Oh, you know what? I need to modify my program. Or, gee, I'm asking for too much money. Maybe I can get some angel seed money to test it to this point and chew up $25,000 of somebody's money before I go out and try and raise the 500. You know, you go to the family members and say, hey, look, it, I got a really good idea. And, you know, if they lose a couple thousand dollars each on you or whatever, it may not be the end of the world. So you will, you know, you have to respond like that. Kind of going along with that, um, when seeking financing or investors, when you have kind of exhausted all of your usual connections, where do you tend to turn turn next? Private families sometimes will give you the money, you know, if you want to go, or a fund, you know. You have to really look at your plan. If everybody's turning you down, you might have to tweak something. <clears throat> Actually, I'll give you a comment um, that relates to both your question. There's a fellow in Chicago by the name of Neil Bloom. He's the B in a company called JMB. He's a billionaire. Um, and years ago, uh, I was at some meeting where he was present. And he said, Neil, I said, you, I mean, you know, in this year, a couple year period, you are acquiring regional shopping centers, bankrolled by Canadian pension funds. And now you're buying, you know, he started off syndicating with doctors and I mean, the lawyers and accountants, a lot of doctor money too. You know, one buying little suburban office buildings. You know, and the next thing you know, he's doing public limited partnerships. And he looked at me after I asked the question, you know, from a couple different angles. He said, Steve, I go to where the money wants to go. <laughs> that is probably the best advice anybody can give you. You have an idea, but if nobody else is interested in putting money up for this thing, what is it that they want to do? It may be kind of similar. I mean, if you want to be a major retailer and you have this retail idea, but nobody buys it, but you hear that everybody's interested in going into this area, and you're an entrepreneur, it's not like I have to build office buildings, because if that was my mantra, I would have had to retire in 2006 when we completed the U.S. Chipson building, because we haven't done one since. Um, so you go to where the money wants to go. You have an interest, a field that you're interested in. You know, if you're, gosh, I know a nurse who wanted to do something in nursing, and she ended up with the biggest temporary nursing um, company, you know, and they all these hospital contacts, and she makes a certain percentage of all those salaries being paid, and she's a multimillionaire today. I don't think you should limit yourself, you know. I think that people pigeonhole themselves and they think that, you know, oh, well, this is exactly, I'm going to live in this box. 
you know, and and you have to stay relevant, you have to stay curious, you have to meet with people. You know, even though we have lots of bankers who are interested in us, there's not a, a week that goes by that I, I don't say, hey, I know somebody else with money. You know, let's go and take them to lunch. Or, or he <laughs> says, hey, I, you know, I know somebody. So we're all, and, and, you know, God gave you two ears and one mouth, and that's so you could listen twice as hard as you speak. I am fascinated by sports and by the faith that these coaches have in these players to play these games. I am enamored with other people's business plans. I have a friend, literally, who should come and speak to this group. She started Benefect, who's now being carried at Neiman Marcus. This was her. I got it. <laughs> her, Thank you. She and her sister, her sister is an OBGYN, and she came from the beauty industry, and together they realized that if you put estrogen in cream and you put it on your face, people like you better. And so they're selling this cream, you know, but in this market, you know, they, you asked where does the money come from, they didn't have enough money. And so they went to a couple of people, private families, that said, we believe in you. And they funded them. And that's how they got it done today. Because no bank was going to say, yeah, we need another cream. <laughs> hey, wait, I'm, I'm like, unlike I'm Walmart example, how much does the average jar of that cream cost? Well, unlike a lot of those creams, Benefect is actually the only cream that's not, you know, being marketed in a generic brand and in a different brand. But creams, there's a huge markup in the beauty industry. And, and you, you know... You didn't answer my question on how much does she sell on average jar? Oh, I'm sorry. Your direct question is about $125 a jar. And it has the highest average. concentration of what? The phytoestrogen. It's a oh. phytoestrogen, so it's an organic estrogen, so it you... actually makes your skin younger. Hmm. Quite expensive. But guess what? You'd be surprised how many people will pay 125 bucks for a jar. Which is a lot cheaper than getting a, fa a facelift. Well, it's uh, not going to be in lieu of a facelift, yeah. but it's still a great idea, <laughs> privately funded by people. So, you know, when I was a young girl um, and my mom asked me what I'm going to do, you know, she didn't crush me and say, you're never going to get there. And, you know, 20 years later, I mean, she did cry, by the way. My mother did cry when... I brought her to my first building, and she said, well, you know, it's really cute. And then two weeks later, she came back, and most of it was in the yard. She's like, oh, my God, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to put it all back together. But if you really know inside of your heart, like it's your passion, and it's really what you want to do, there's going to be a lot of people. You know, even on the big building, K2, there were lots of people that told me, you're never going to get that building done in this economy. And, and, but you and know, I was wondering about that until the day before we closed. <laughs> the financing yeah, you know, with five banks after <coughs> turned down by over 50 it took, it took a lot of time. You know, we, and, you know, we come from a day where it took a lot of uh, time to earn people's trust. And usually when Steve and I would go in to see the banks, they would always say, well, let's see your financials and let's, let's see this and let's go there. And we were used to being on the the firing line, but with K2, the banks were in trouble. And so Steve and I had the chance to sit back and say, wait, are you, is your bank going to go run for Wait, 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 how much does your, you know, what are your holdings? And, and we said, God, this is so interesting. Nobody's beating us up because, you know, we're ready, willing, and able. But I would tell you, even with our track record, even with, you know, Steve's illustrious career, um, there were lots of people who said, you are never going to get that building done, and never ever did I walk away saying, you never let them in your side of your head. And by the way, <clears throat> the biggest point of contention in the loan documents was between the banks fighting if what would the rest of the banks do if one of the banks failed <laughs> oh, and sure. didn't meet their funding requirement. Oh. A question that in my entire career I would never heard asked, and that was in October of last fall. <clears throat> so it's a different world we're living in today. All right, we have time for one more if there is one more. Uh, all right, there you go. Thank you. He's going to call you for lunch. Notes. Did you have a question back there? Um, I saw you scribbling faster than anybody. Yeah, I have no. <laughs> no question? No question? You don't have some entrepreneurial thing you'd like to do? like? Yeah, I do. I'm sorry. I'm shy today. <laughs> all right, then go ahead. Thank you. So it sounds like you started in the Chicago market. Is that accurate? Yes. Um, so what made you, you know, Chicago's a big city, obviously. What made you want to go to these other markets? I mean, is there an advantage to spreading things out? <coughs> I mean, yeah, I'll give you a couple. Um, when I came out of graduate school, I had to work for a large developer in Chicago. So I got to apprentice with the guys who built Water Tower Place and most of the malls around Chicago. 
was a great place to see things from a different perspective, which was my good fortune. Uh, when we started building in Chicago, one of the things we realized is that, you know, there are different sub-markets within the Chicago area. And, you know, if office buildings are good downtown, they may not be good in the suburbs. There are no, fee there we're aware of feasible apartment sites in the suburbs of Chicago, maybe one of the infill suburbs, you might be able to do something in their downtown area. So what drove us out to, to look outside Chicago is we realized, for example, today there are over 3,000 apartment units under construction. You know, we're doing 496 of them. And we're all going to deliver in the same year and a half period. So we don't really have room for another new one to be delivered. So we have staffs, we have the capability of building you know, this much a year, and there's only one market in Chicago that works for multifamily, and that's crowded right now. So we have to kind of buy our time for another year or so before we can start another project. So that drove us years ago because these things happen cyclically. You know, condos are hot for seven or eight years, and then they go cold. Uh, by the way, I've been around long enough. I've seen that cycle three times. <laughs> okay. uh, I actually refused to do condos the last two cycles and then kind of got caught up like other people saying, oh, what the heck, let's give it a, give it a run. Um, so we looked around markets. That, now, it's funny, we went to California because um, we love California. I mean, as a physical place, uh, it's not a very practical place to go. It's a four-hour plane ride each way. She and I are there every two to three weeks for three or four days, you know, and trying to juggle our children at school. So it's a challenge. You know, if you're going to branch out, you're going to go to Minneapolis, you know, Cincinnati, you know, someplace that's an hour or two hour flight from you to do it. And when you're in real estate, you have to have people locally. You have to have construction people, project managers, and the like. You can't run jobs from, I mean, we had a job in China, and our senior guy on it was flying, I'm mean, not China, uh, uh, Waikiki, would fly from Chicago Feel, to like China. Honolulu. <laughs> Nine hour flight each way. Yeah. And he had to go out every two or three weeks, I was kind of wondering how long he would last before I said, forget it, I'm not doing it. But it, it worked out uh, for him. I mean, it didn't work out for us. But, um, you know, you, you, you have to look for feasible deals. And if they're not in your backyard, I, we were at a conference the other day, and I said, you know, the problem with, the, with the, this was all my competitors building all these buildings present. So the problem with Chicago is we only have one submarket we can build in. In Los Angeles, we're working in five different submarkets, and not one of them overlaps with the other. Each one is unique from the other. And so there's plenty of room, you know, in Northern California, Southern California, Seattle. All of those have multiple markets. And so, you know, it's easier for entrepreneurial developers, you know, to be able to be able to do two or three things at a time instead of just one every couple of years. This, this was a journey, by the way. You know, and you, you know, when I told you to make your goals, we, we made them a one-year goal, a two-year goal, a five-year goal, a 10-year goal, a 15-year goal, a 20-year goal. I, it's hard for me to believe we're coming up on our 25th goal, and we have kids leaving for college, and we're like, I'm like, oh my God, you know, this is wild, you know? And, um, but the, the point that I wanted to make is that, you know, when I started with Steve, I had no desire to be a commercial developer, and he had no desire to be a residential person. So the fact that we're actually as immersed and enmeshed as we are today is just a wonder. But it, it, Steve would buy land in Schomburg, and I'd be like, what are you going to do in Schomburg? Do you have in mind? And, and he would say, why are you going to buy a house in Kenilworth? Are you out of your mind? And then one day we met for lunch, and we said, you know, what are we going to be? You know, and this is after 15 years. And we finally decided we're going to be urban infill developers. And once we decided, it was easy to say, well, this is close to the hospital, and, and this is close to, you know, these other services. And, and, and then we became an amenity-driven, lifestyle-focused company. And, and all of a sudden, things, it's like, you know, watching The Matrix, where it all comes together for Neo. Things just start coming, and you see it so much quicker. <coughs> Somebody calls you about land, and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, these condos are, are terrible, and, but their people are buying them. But look at all these conversions. Oh, my gosh, the light bulb goes off. We need apartments. You know, so now in, you know, I'm 20... I'm afraid of that. 
metaphor, though, because Neil ends up sacrificing himself <laughs> to save Zion. <laughs> Rainbow gets pushed from a bridge. Yeah, right. So he gets sacrificed. But it's a journey, you know. And don't cage yourself in, you know. Just, you know, stay open to, to follow things. the money. <laughs> That's a fantastic way to end this. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you.